Thanks very much, Jane. That was very nice. I didn't recognise myself from the description. <laughs> um, particularly that it was very nice of you to say nice things about the business school, because uh, as a leader, you don't quite often know whether you've succeeded in getting an organisation to where you, you would have liked it to be when you came. I can tell you, we're definitely not where I thought we'd be in nine years. I thought we'd be there in five. Um, so I, I have the privilege though, of being in charge of, uh, a, of a business school which has around about 8,000 students. So it's actually bigger than some of the other Scottish universities. And half of those students are not in, in Edinburgh. Half are, half are in Hong Kong, Singapore, um, India, and various other places, mainly out in Asia. Um, so I have to be a leader as well as researching it, which is, which is really interesting because you sort of walk in and you say, yeah, I'm professor of strategy and leadership. And everybody goes, oh, so our new boss is a professor of strategy and leadership. And you imagine academics. We'll soon sort that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm still here nearly nine years later. So you know, I've survived. And, and can I just give you one figure that, that's really important to me in that? Uh, the average lifespan of a dean in a business school in the UK is two years. So I must have conned people really well. <laughs> um, so I, I just want to get over that, that I actually have to do leadership as well as research in it. It's not, you know, it's, it's a, uh, the business school turns over um, getting on for 40 million pounds. So it's a, you know, reasonable sized organization in its, its own right. That's about, uh, that's almost half the university's turnover. So, y you know, it is a fairly substantial business on its own. And can I say that that's not only f less than 50% of that money now comes from the funding council. Almost 60% of it comes from, um, if you like, earning money, from, from doing things which earn money. So it's real business. It's not, you know, it's not just getting more students and getting more funding from the government. I'm just trying to make myself credible. <laughs> uh, the other bit, um, what do I know about the destination part of it? Um, well, until... Um, Two years ago, when, when I appointed Graham Burse as the uh, director of the Edinburgh Institute, I was on the board of Marketing Edinburgh and what was Destination Edinburgh Marketing Alliance before that. So I have a bit of, you know, there's a, the des I got the destination bit in from the first name. So, so, you know, I have some awareness from that perspective as well. So I hope I can just shed some light on it. Right, I hope we're going to have a bit of fun as well. Uh, I hope we're going to interrupt me anytime you like. Feel free to contradict me or question anything that I say, right? By all means, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, I'm the professor, I know everything, I really, really don't. Um, what I've learned about leadership is how little I know and how much I've still got to learn. Um, and that's the only big thing about leadership that I would say. It is really important to learn from your mistakes because you will make hundreds of them. Uh, what you've got to do is, is reflect on when you've made those mistakes and, um, and think, how would I do it if I did it again? And I'll give you, a, just start with a classic example. I'll tell lots of little stories if you don't mind, because I think they, you know, somebody mentioned before examples, I think they really bring stuff to life. But when I first started my job at the business school, I always remember on my first day sitting in my office uh, as a dean. I think, oh my God, <laughs> how am I gonna, not, hey, great, you know, I'm the boss. It was like, oh no, I'm <laughs> responsible for all these people. And I think it just, came home to me at the end of that day, what it was all about, you know, talking to people. Um, and I thought, oh my, my God, how will I do it? So I think that's really important as well. You, you've got to be fairly clear and know, know where you want things to go. You've not got to stick to that rigidly. And the other bit is just to, you know, never get, and I've met quite a few people who get sort of, they believe their own bullshit, <laughs> you know, and actually the longer, and I'm a bit worried about this because I've been in the job a long time. And what I've noticed with a lot of leaders is that if they're in the job for too long, they really, really believe their own rubbish. Uh, and I hope I'm not doing that. I'm trying desperately not to. Um, but just to give you the story that I was going to give you, which was early on, we were having an event to um, welcome a new chancellor. Tim Waterston's the chancellor of the university. So we, we closed the campus on a Wednesday afternoon because we had to prepare it for, for him to come along. And a couple of my staff got really <coughs> upset that we were closing the campus uh, and that they thought the classes would be cancelled. They weren't. They were moved to another campus, which was a bit of an inconvenience. So they wrote really bullshit emails to the principal saying, this is disgraceful. We're supposed to put the students first. I mean, for the right reasons, but the way they did it. And they went straight over my head. So you can imagine 
I hadn't been there very long. I wasn't very happy. So what did I do? I called them in and I shouted at them <laughs> and I waved my finger at them and I told, you know, and uh, they went out the door and told everybody, uh, which was not a good thing. Well, what we've got here is a right straight, you know, if you do anything, da -da -da, he's going to lose his temper with you, he's going to be not... Uh, and of course, I sat in my office afterwards and thought, you got that completely wrong, didn't you? You know, uh, and I can honestly say I don't think I've ever shouted at anybody <laughs> since I took over. I felt like it. I've kicked the filing cabinet when I walked back <laughs> in the room. Uh, and my, my PA is the only person I, I don't shout at. Uh, I shout, and she knows it's just getting it off my chest. We have, we have an arrangement. I say, if I upset you, tell me. <laughs> but, but she lets me do it, because you do need, you know, yeah. you're human. You do need to be able to let off, let off steam. So what, what I'll probably talk about as much as anything, if you don't mind, is just... And hey, this is not saying I've done it really well. It's it's just a little bit of what I've learned trying trying to, to be a leader, as well as a bit of the theory. Because one of the things you find when you look at leadership, Pip said the toolbox is this big. It's actually <laughs> huge <laughs> and very confusing. Um, uh, and it's interesting. That I, I went to a talk where somebody did a thing on leadership theories. And it was just incredible, because a lot of them say the same thing in different ways. So I, I think it's about sorting out, you know, really what it's all about. And, and it's about three things, and all I'm going to talk about are the three things. It's about you, the context that you lead in, and the outcomes that you want to get, which is why I've called it outcomes-based leadership. That's not a theory, that's just a, an approach that I'm adopting this morning. So the, the context, so you being you, and I'll come back to that. The context that you work in, being the people that you work with, the organization that you're part of, the industry you work in, the country you work in, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the last bit is, what is it you want to achieve? Um, and I think those three things are, for me, distill what it's all about. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about, because it's, it's you know, as I know it. Um, I'd say, thanks very much. Um, let's start with a bit of fun. And this is why I was shouting at Pip, because she actually showed you the answers. <laughs> Get that off the screen quick. I hope you didn't know. So, okay, we're going to have an election for a world leader. And we can only choose from some ex-politicians. Um, uh, and and you've, got, you've got to decide which one of them we're going to choose. What I want you to do is base your choice just on what you see there. All right? Just what you see. So the first one... He's a heavy drinker, often arrives at work at noon, very controversial career, a lot of failures, some successes, but a lot of failures as well, uh, and wasn't elected to power. Okay, second one, married three times, refused to refute violence, he had a history of terrorism, in prison for 25 years, and very unsuccessful in his early career. The third one, he's a vegetarian, monogamous, I kind of say I apologise, they're all men. <laughs> and I never noticed that before. Non-drinker, I'll have to change that, won't I? People will kill me if I don't. Uh, uh, wrote a book on political philosophy, elected to power. Yeah, so it's a fairly stable sort of person. The last one, a drinker, a womanizer. Rumours that his family fixed the elections and he had connections to the mafia. Right. If you saw that on the surface, which one would you elect? <laughs> you would, you'd elect the heavy drinker. Great, hey, good on you. In that case, I get the job. <laughs> um, three. three. Yeah, right. Okay. Looking at it logically like that, basing your judgment on, on that. Well, shall we look at who they are? <laughs> right. Now. <laughs> Who did we just elect? <laughs> Adolf Hitler. Right, and I think there's a bit of that if you can't judge a book by the cover. And uh, the other bit, point I was trying to make is that nobody's perfect. Right? Nobody at all is perfect. And sometimes be careful what you want. You quite like, if you look at a lot of leaders, they're not perfect people. They're flawed. And I'm talking about leaders at the top. The point is that we're all flawed. And 
I don't mean leadership is only the people at the top of organizations. Leadership is very definitely not. Um, if everybody behaved like a leader, life would be a lot easier at work. When, when I was talking about this at, in, in the business school, I, I said leadership's at all levels, and this was talking to the staff. And, and one person said, no, no, leaders are people at the top. I'm not a leader. Uh, and I said, you are. No, I'm not. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm a lecturer. I said, so when you walk in a classroom, there's not a leader in the room, is there not? You know, and and, and I'm, I talk about being student-led and stuff, you know, but that doesn't mean that they're, not, they're organizing and coordinating it and making it all happen. And, you know, if you're trying to lecture, what are you trying to do? You're trying to motivate people to want to learn, aren't you? Well, leadership's about trying to motivate people, is it not? I think. <laughs> if it's not, I've been doing the wrong thing all this time. Um, so, you know, it, it, it is about, you're all leaders. I nearly asked you the question at the beginning, and I don't rehearse very much of this anymore because it goes stale, so I'll probably miss a couple of things out. Hopefully not like Ed Miliband. I won't, <laughs> I won't miss out about the government debt bit, you know, which was a fairly critical error. <laughs> um, anyway, so m the point of that is, you look at leaders, they're very different. Very, very different. And some of them are great. I mean, people, Winston Churchill, I'm pleased to, I, I actually admire Churchill greatly. But interestingly, uh, uh, he wasn't elected to power. It was a coalition formed during the Second World War. And when it came to an election, at the end of the Second World War, sorry, he lost. He lost the first election at the end of the Second World War. Which is really, you know, we all see him as a great leader, but he lost the election. Leaders don't always win. Um, have any of you seen the film Invictus, which is about Mandela? Uh, I, I think it's a great, it's much better than Long March to Freedom. Much better of a movie, in my, in my view. Despite the fact they've got Matt Damon playing a, a South African <laughs> rugby player. He actually does it quite well. Um, and it's, it, I won't give you the gist, but it is about Mandela. And there's a really, really, I, th I think, fascinating bit which, which sort of sums up what leadership's all about. Uh, and that is, um, Mandela's in, well, there's a couple of bits. Mandela's come to power and it shows you the first day in his office. And his security guys walk in the door, and they're all black, of course. And they go down to the office and meet the security guys that have been there before, and they're all white. In fact, you imagine security, they're probably people that have been persecuting the blacks and so on. So he's got, his guys come flying back, and there's, there's a lot of white guys in there. They're the old security guys. You know what they're like? They're Afrikaans. They're dreadful. And he says, um, well, this is the new South Africa. If, we can't, if you guys can't work together, how can we make South Africa work? Get yourselves back in there and do it. Right? He didn't give in to them and say, OK, guys, I'll get rid of them. Now, the other bit, which I think was much more impressive as well, but it's all part of the same story, was um, there's the South African Sports Commission. Now, the Springboks, the South African rugby team, were hated by the blacks, absolutely despised by them, because they're the, they were the symbol of white supremacy. Right? Absolute symbol of it. So the Sports Council is voting to get rid of the name Springboks because they think it's symbol. And of course, you know, they've come into power and they think, well, we'll kick them in the teeth a bit. You know, look what they've done to us over the years. So Mandela hears that they, they are about, or that they have just voted to get rid of the name Springboks. And he knows that will absolutely alienate all the whites in South Africa. He knows that he'll just, you know, that'll be it. You'll have a divided society. Okay, blacks will be in power. It's the other way around, and they're the majority, so you might say, fair enough. But the whites, are, but he also knows the whites, he's very pragmatic, Mandela. He knows the whites are really important in terms of the economy, because they own a lot of it, so he wants to keep them on board. He's not stupid. He knows that if they disappear and take all the wealth with them, South Africa is bankrupt. So he goes along to the meeting and says, I've just heard that you voted overwhelmingly, it's a, you know, completely, you know, it's, a, it's an absolute majority to get rid of the, the Springboks. And this, to me, is what leadership's all about. He stands up and he says, that's completely wrong. I want you to change that decision. And here's why. We're in a new South Africa. We've just been persecuted for all these years. If we want South Africa to work, we can't do that back. We have got to integrate the white population in with the black population and become a nation together. And they changed the decision. Now my point there is 
sometimes being a leader, being a leader is easy when you're doing easy, when you're doing nice things and everything's going well. But when you've got to make tough decisions like that and give people bad news and persuade them to do something that, you know, I'm sure a lot of black people still thought, I'm not sure this is the right thing. I'm, not, I'm sure the power of his speech didn't persuade them. It persuaded them to sort of vote differently, but I'm not sure it changed their mindset for a long time. But that, to me, is a really powerful moment. That's what leadership's about. It's about can you take people with you when uh, they don't actually like the idea very much, when it's a very tough decision? Can you get them to come along? Without telling them to do it, he persuades them. He does tell them, but he, he sort of leaves it to them. He says, I think you should change your decision. And they do. And that, that, I think that's the difference. You're not actually saying, this is what I'm telling you to do. No. You must do it. It's you're actually changing. It's the persuasion. Absolutely. No, that's what it's all about. Right? Now, this stuff all sounds great. And I hope you're gonna, all going to go away and fuse and try and do it. But trust me, your, your mean streak will come through some time. <laughs> or your bad streak, or your bad temper, because you will get into work in the morning and some will, something will upset you. But as a leader, remember the impact that has on people. I always remember when I was a, a lecturer in my, my first job, walking past the dean, and he didn't speak to me. And for me, it was like, I must have done something wrong. You know, you know, it wasn't at all. I, I did nothing wrong, he just had something. But for me, it was like, well, you didn't speak. What have I done? And I'm still a bit like that, I've got to say. You know, if somebody senior to me walks past or, or appears to be a little bit grumpy, I still think it's me. Now, I think you've got to get that into your heads, that when you're leading people, that they have an impression of you. And some of that goes with, some of it does go with you know, your, your place in the hierarchy, I've got to say. I, what I noticed most when I became a dean was how people's attitudes changed. <laughs> Suddenly you got a whole lot of, you know, there was all this sort of almost respect, I mean they've lost all that now, they've got over it, <laughs> <laughs> but initially there was, there was a lot of respect there just because I was the dean. And what you come to realise is that sometimes it's the symbolism of the role that you're in that is really important and you have to respect that. You know, you know it's not just about you, it's about respect for the, the role that you're playing in the organisation, you've got, got to try and get that across. So, let's move on to a bit more, not serious stuff because I don't want any of it to be serious. Yeah. Absolutely. And if you, you know, the same goes for entre entrepreneurs as well. If you look at most successful entrepreneurs, they failed several times. But yeah, really good point. So what is leadership? I'm not going to read the slides off to you because I hate it when people walk in and read slides to me. <laughs> I quite like the second one. <laughs> and that's a bit about the Mandela bit. Yeah, I really think that's quite quite neat. I, I like that as a, as a definition. It is. It's persuading people to do because they think it's the right thing to do, not because you're telling them. Yeah? So what's the difference between leadership and management? That's management for you. Okay, now anybody in a role where they are responsible for people has got to do both. But I always see it as like a, a balance. And in my view, and it's probably because I'm lazy actually, <laughs> I, I, I would I try to tip the balance towards leadership because I think you have to do less management, and I just prefer leading than managing. I, I don't actually like telling people what to do or instructing them or enforcing rules. You know, that's, that's not what other people do. Now, you've got to have a leadership style that suits you. I mean, that's the, the other thing to take out this morning. You've got to be the leader in your way, not in the way that somebody else does it. Don't try and copy somebody else. It won't work, you know, because it won't be authentic. It won't be you. It's got to be you. And you are what you are. And that doesn't say, you know, that means I can behave really badly all the time. 
Um, what it means is, you know, I'll, I'll try and lead people, you know, from the beliefs that I have and from me as a person, and I'll try and control, you know, the, the aspects of my personality that are not good as a leader as well. And you, you won't do it all the time, but you try to. And I think the other, the other thing I'd say, <laughs> I've said about learning, I've said about, uh, uh, what did I just say? <laughs> uh, the, but the, the other thing is to um, admit it when you get it wrong. I think that's really critical. I hate it when people cover up when they get something wrong or blame somebody else. I think that's awful. You know, I really, really, and, and the, the converse of that is always give people the credit for what they do and don't take the credit for what other people do yourself. You know, like this Destination Leaders program, if it's successful, it was all me. You know, it was my idea. And all. Well, it wasn't. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> but do you, do you see what I mean? You get the example. Yeah, yeah. Do you think, I mean, fundamentally, I think that's really crucial. I think that's why we have so much mistrust in our, in our politicians. It's because I think they sort of tease people and they work with them to the they get it wrong. Yeah. And, and they take credit for stuff which wasn't there. Well, we'll say that, yeah. <laughs> No, no. Well, I hope I, I would always, for example, if I was talking to the principal about this program, I wouldn't try and, you know, because as the dean, you can take everything you want, you know. <laughs> I wouldn't. I would always mention Jane and Kenneth and the other people that are involved with the program. And particularly if they, you know, I, I would do that because I think it's important that they get the credit that they deserve for it. And actually, Ben, I still, I st the glory rubs off on you anyway. <laughs> you know, it's not that it's not that you know, you're the dean. So if it goes, you know, the big thing you know is that if it goes right, you'll probably get some of the credit, and if it goes wrong, you'll certainly get the blame. <laughs> and you've just got to go. That's the way it is. It's what I get paid for. Um, and that, I mean, that sounds easy and glib. I I have a lot of sleepless nights about my job. I really do. There, there are lots of times when, you know. Um, I was talking about our income. If it doesn't like our income from the overseas stuff that we do is going to be up to level, but then it can mean that we've got to lose jobs. And I've been through one round of redundancies years ago, and it was horrible. And I never want to go there again. But do you know what? So I worry about it. I worry about stuff like that. Um, you worry about losing your good staff. You know, how are you going to replace them? But that's, the, you know, that, I, I just think that, that, for me, that feels better than the other side. Um, it isn't really, but you, you need to do both, but I just feel more comfortable with it. Um, anyway, do I do all that? I'm not so sure I'm good at the coaching bit. <laughs> Some of the other bits I think I'm reasonably good at. Um, I'm, I'm terrible. When people say to me, well, how do I do what I do this? I just tell them what to do, and people go, ah! <laughs> you get them to reflect on it. And you should, you really should. I'm just not very good at it. I'm better than I used to be. I have learned from you. It has worked. <laughs> um, and there's uh, another quote that I like. I think quotes are great, actually. There's some things that... Um, and I think that's true in a lot of organisations today. They will espouse leadership. Everybody espouses leadership these days, the virtues of it. I still think in the, you know, the university, we espouse leadership. And, and remember um, Moscow rules here. Uh, you know, what stays in Moscow, what goes in Mos on in Moscow stays in Moscow. Um, so please, um, I don't want any of that going, but I still think, to a degree in the university, everybody talks about leadership and it being important. I still think we're really heavily focused on all, all this. People are driven by KPIs and managing to them and all that sort of stuff. You know, you know, and I wish we could shift more the other way. And I think we are. I think, actually, if I... That was a bit unfair at the university. If I compare it to when I came eight years ago to where we are now, I think we have moved an awful long way in that direction, but I still see a bit of that about it. And I think you do in a lot of organisations. Um, Could you just talk a bit about taking a risk? Because looking at those lists, it seems that management is somebody's already done something and put it in place, and then therefore you are fulfilling your policies or your procedures, whereas the leaders are the ones, you know, just for example, you taking on this course, that's potentially a risk if it's not all well. Yeah, that's right. then persuading people actually it, it could be a good idea with X, Y, and Z. Of, co of course it's about taking a risk. And, you know, and, and I'm not advocating you take unnecessary risks. It is about taking managed risks. Uh, uh, and it's interesting, if, if, if you're a good leader, you 
have a lot of people with you who have different characteristics to you. Right. Um, you know, if I was, um, I, I, I did a, you've done my Briggs. I did a different psychometric years and years ago. And when the guy was giving me feedback, uh, he said, you're very strategic, you know, extrovert, all this sort of stuff. He says, but I wouldn't put you in charge of a nuclear power station because it would probably <laughs> blow up. <laughs> and, and I said, yeah, you're probably right, actually. Because I think I knew myself well enough to, to, to know that, in that, and I said it's about context as well. I, I, I wouldn't work in that. I couldn't work as a leader in that context. I'd be hopeless, absolutely hopeless. Uh, and I think you know the, the balance between the two will vary on what you operate in. But if you're talking about a, an environment like you guys operate in, you've got to be able to take a bit of risk, I think. But it's got to be managed risk. You've got to, you know, hasn't, it can't be catastrophic for the organisation. And I think that's the judgment I use. If this went wrong, would it be absolutely catastrophic? If it would be, then I think you shouldn't do it. However good the outcome looks like it might be, but if it wouldn't be catastrophic, if it would maybe lose a little bit of money or whatever, but hey, but, but it, the gains are potentially enormous, do it. Um, so yes, I, th I think so. Um, there's no rights and wrongs in all this, it's all opinion. Anyway, you know, some great leaders. What have they got in common? There's only one thing they've got in common, they're all leaders. Nothing else. <coughs> you know, and I said great with a, a question mark. Uh, you go to China, and China's really interesting when uh, attitudes on Mao. Um, we sort of all think he's evil. You know, the Cultural Revolution, millions of people died, and, and all that sort of stuff. You talk to most Chinese, and I can't say everybody because I haven't spoken to 1.4 billion people in China, <laughs> um, but I've spoken to a reasonable cross section when I when I travel there because I spend a fair bit of time there. And what I think one of them summed it up beautifully to me. They say, we think Mao was a great leader. And I said, how can you think that? Well, they said, do you know what? Two thirds of what he did was really good for China. And the other third was bad. And two thirds is bigger than one third. So we think he was a great leader. Uh, do, do you see what I mean? So there was that, that, that. So I think my other point was, you know, what, what do you mean great leader? Um, Margaret Thatcher's hated in Scotland. I mean, one of the things that surprised me when I moved up here, we're both from North East. She wasn't exactly loved in the North East, but I don't think there were any parties when she died. And there were in Scotland. And I, and I just went, oh. I spoke to a couple of people, because I, uh, I, I thought The Iron Lady was a really good movie. Um, it, you know, I don't like Margaret Thatcher <laughs> any, any more than the next person. But I thought it was a good movie, and it gave you a bit of insight into you know, where she came from and what happened to her and yeah, it showed the good and the bad. I mean, the worst bit was the way she dealt with, uh, I think it was Geoffrey Rippon at one of the cabinet meetings where she made him look, it was really bad leadership. I, I actually met, I met her once at Downing Street, um, only because, you know, I was, as usual, I was riding on the back of other people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my students at the time, because I, I used to teach a bit of politics, won a competition and the, the prize was morning morning coffee with Margaret Thatcher at number 10. Um, <laughs> uh, we, we, actually, it was great. <laughs> I mean, what it was. And I'll tell you what, she is, I've never met a person with, with, a, with more of an aura, and it's the only way I can describe it, of power than her. Because we we're, we're, you know, a bunch of people from the Northeast, young, young students from the North, ah, we're going to tell her what we think of it. This was 1980, 1985, I think. Uh, we're going to tell her what we think of her. All of us here, hey. And we get in the door and we're all like little lambs. <laughs> well, Mrs. Thatcher. And, uh, and we weren't the only ones. I think what, what, what impressed me most was that the, the prize was given by the CEO of, of SO UK. So, you know, important uh, director and everything. And um, he was absolutely speechless. And she had this way of speaking. I tell you, it was incredible. When she spoke to a room like this, she would fix you in the eye like that and stare into your eyes right, until you looked away. Right? And she did it with everybody. I mean, you couldn't do it in a room with 1,000 people, but in a room with, you know, there were what, about 10 of us? She did that. And you were just like, whoa, absolutely. That was it, she had you. You, you, were, you were done. 
<laughs> Honestly, I really mean it. <laughs> um, it was incredible. And I'd never, I don't think, met anybody. And I haven't since. I've heard, actually, Bill Clinton could be the same. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, no. It, it, it is strange. It was really now. Um, you, you know, she she was honestly that was what it was like. It was I can just describe what I found. Um, but not everybody can have that charisma, if you want to call it that. And actually, there's been a lot of research done to show that charismatic leaders are really quite dangerous because <laughs> uh, they tend to be narcissistic as well. Um, so. The point is, they're all different, and they all lead in, in different ways. And we'll tell you to tell the truth. I'll tell you another great story about, I've got lots of good stories, but, <laughs> but I think they do make points. Um, Mother Teresa, Tim Waterston, who I mentioned before, who's the Chancellor of our university. Um, what, Tim has, um, oh, I think, about eight or nine kids by, you don't want to know how many marriages. <laughs> uh, and w one of them, one of them, uh, is actually adopted from Mother Teresa, uh, from her orphanage in India. And, uh, you know, she, she'd grown up with Tim, and I think she's called, I think she's called Mina. And uh, she came into Tim one day when she was about 11, 12 years old and said, I've just seen on the news Mother Teresa's coming to London. Can you arrange for me to meet her? I would love to see her again. You know, after all, she's why I'm with you, she brought me up, and he said, I'll see what I can do. And of course he is pretty well connected. So he managed, you know, through various circles to find out where she was. She was staying in a convent in London. And he took his daughter along and they, they said, um, Mother Teresa's having a nap, you'll just have to wait until she's ready to see you. And um, so they sat and they waited and they waited and they waited. And eventually, uh, they were sitting at the bottom of a set of stairs at Eventually, at the top of the stairs, Mother Teresa arrives. And the sun's behind her, so she looks like she's got a halo around her head. And she walks straight to the little girl and says, Hello, Mina, how are you? It's great to see you. Right? Now, she actually hadn't got a bloody clue who she was. She'd been told by her aides who it was. But she knew the impact that that would have on the little girl who was like, Oh, she remembers me. Isn't that incredible? Now, now, it was a little bit of a lie, but, but it wasn't done for her. It was done to make that little girl feel really good. Do, do you know what I mean? But she knew what it was, and that there's a little bit of the emotional intelligence people about you know, what will make other people feel good or positive. You know, can, can you bring that out in them? And it's not possible with everybody you meet. You know, but, but if you can, it's a really good thing to do, isn't it? Just make somebody feel good, feel good. Not for the wrong reasons, for the right reasons. I'm pr I'm, Pip will tell you, I'm breaking half the rules here, but hey, I don't care. <laughs> I'm just telling you the way that it is. Um, so there's a zillion different theories of leadership. And all I've done, the, you know, the, the, you know the, there are others that sit be beneath it, that sit within these categories. Uh, and, you know, when you've been in this sort of feel as long as us, you're pretty familiar with most of them, or more familiar with some than others. <coughs> uh, and to be honest with you, there's a little bit of, I like that theory, I don't like that one. <laughs> so I'm going to focus on the one that, well, because it works for you, you know, and, and, and you, you believe in it. So don't, what I'm trying to do is give you a little bit of, a, a little thing around which you can make sense out of it all. Read the others, pick on them, but you know, you, you get all these things, I'm not sure when I run out of the list, I'll go on the next slide of it. But you, you, you know, these are all categories that you can put leadership theories into. Um, I'm not going to go through what they mean. I mean, it's fairly evident, inspirational. It's a bit like I was, we were describing with Bill Clinton and Margaret Thatcher. They were, in a way, inspirational. But not everybody's inspirational. 
I've worked for some people who've been, I mean, let, let me give you the example. I, I give the example of Churchill before. Churchill won the Second World, well, not won it single-handedly, but led the, you know, uh, uh, an important part of the victory in the Second World War. He was replaced by Clement Attlee. And Clement Attlee is, and his government, the Labour government at that time, were responsible for um, the education bill, which gave us all the education system we have. <coughs> he was responsible for the National Health Service, the Social Security system, some of probably what were the greatest achievements, you know, from a social perspective in, in the UK. Have you ever seen him? He is the most uninspired. If you ever see him speak, you know when Harry Enfield does these spoof uh, bits of old film, it's like that. He's got the little glasses on, he's got no piss, he's awfully, awfully, you know. He's like that. He's a nobody, if you, if you see what I mean, in terms of being inspirational. But look what he achieved. But he didn't single handedly. But I mean, that's the important thing. Leaders on their own don't achieve anything. Because guess what? You can't be a leader unless you have followers, right? <laughs> and people only follow you if they actually like the direction that you're going in. You know, a lot of leaders, you know, they're off and they look around and whoop, there's nobody there behind me. They're not a leader anymore because nobody's following them. Um, so it's, it's about that. So how can we make sense of it all? What, what can I tell you? In, oh, there's transformational as well. And emotional intelligence is another thing. You know, they're all important. You know, emotional intelligence is important. It's really just understand. It's two things. It's understanding you, and it's trying to understand other people and how you interact with them. That's what emotional intelligence is. And sometimes you can be really good at it, and other times you can be absolutely terrible. You know? um, so, this is how I try and personally, at a personal level, try and pull it all together. And some of the words sound very grand, you know, philosophy and all that. Um, uh, uh, and some of the others aren't. But so the first bit is you. It's about what you believe in. It's about the style that, that you adopt. It's about the behaviors that you have and the skill set you have, because I think that's really important, recognizing what your skill set is. Uh, and like everything, play to your strengths. Be aware of your weaknesses and try and overcome them, but play to your strengths. What, what, what is it you know, that makes you what you are? Um, you know, where do you need to manage that and park it a little bit? Because you will, inevitably. Um, your philosophy is, is, is essentially what your values, what your beliefs. What do you think about how the world works? And values are really, really important. The style is about, are you, you know, an up and at them leader at the front, you know, waving the sword about? Or are you one that quietly reflects on it and does all the planning and then people get on and do it? You can be successful as either. You don't have to be. You know, and sometimes you've got, you know, as a leader, you've got to change. You, you have to. I, I, you know, the psychometric stuff you're doing, I have my preferences. And uh, there are other things that I have which are sort of learned preferences where I know I've got to do them and I've got to learn to be good at them. You know, so um, when you come on to do, I, I don't know how much you've done around this. Um, I forget what I'm at, I could look it up. I'm an E, as you might imagine, I'm an E. <laughs> an extra. ENFP, I would guess. I think so, I think you're probably right. Yeah. Um, and that means technically I'm not that good at detail and stuff. I get bored with it. But do you know what? I know I've got to do it sometimes. I know when I go in for my meeting with the director of finance, <laughs> I've got to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Otherwise, he'll walk all over me. The good thing is actually being like I am. They always expect me not to know what I'm talking about on those things. And <laughs> you can really amaze them on occasions. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's about you. And behaviors are important. You know, the walk the talk bit is really important. If you say one thing and do another, people will see through you straight away. <coughs> um, it's about the context that you're in. Because uh, I have worked in different contexts. I can tell you 
leading and managing in an academic institution in a university is totally different from working in, say, retail or manufacturing. It's completely different. You know, it, it is literally, in an academic environment, it's herding cats. You know, people can always think of a million reasons why not to do something. They are great at, you know, because they're taught to be critical, thinkers, and guess what? They're really critical. <laughs> <laughs> and you've just got to go, that's because it's where we are here. How do I persuade them? And, and academics are great at, if you, if you tell them what to do, they're great at just not doing it. So you've got to persuade all the time and cajole and push and pull and, you know, try and bring them along. Um, and that's what it's about. Because the culture that you operate in in any, in any setting will, will be different. And you've got to learn about the culture. And culture is really hard to learn about. Because you can't touch it, you can't feel it. You just sense it. You know, it's how do people behave? Why do they behave like that? Because they do behave differently in different settings. You know, if you've ever, I always remember going to parents' evenings at my kids' school and the teacher saying, What a wonderful daughter you've got. She's great. And this is our teenage daughter that sulks, and, mm -hmm. and this teenage son was even worse, I have to tell you. But they're saying, What a wonderful, they're really helpful. And you go, what? <laughs> You've all been there, haven't you? <laughs> you, you know. so, so people behave differently in different situations. I mean, I find it fascinating at work where you get somebody who's really, really difficult at work, and then you happen to get talking to them about something that they do. And, you know, they're really interesting people and they're really enthusiastic. You know, they're really at work dour and dull and boring and unenthusiastic and subversive. <laughs> And you get talking and you find they do something. Actually, sometimes that's a great connection to make. Do take the time to get to know about the people who work for you beyond what they do at work. And do be willing to share a little bit. Don't over-disclose, but do be willing to, to share some of the stuff about you. Um, you know, I, I, I do that all the time. It just, I think it makes a, a real difference to how people behave towards you as well. Um, and then it's about... What do you want the, the outcomes of your leadership to be? You know? Um, these are the sort of things that I think any leader wants to get. So think carefully about the consequences of how you behave and what you do and what the values are that you hold and what that will have on the impact that will have on achieving the outcomes that you want to achieve. Like, you know, my behavior towards those couple of guys that I shouted at because they'd gone over my head to the principal and I thought they behaved outrageously. I still think they behaved outrageously. That bit hasn't changed. Um, but the way I would deal with it has changed absolutely completely. It would be a quiet conversation. I would try to understand why it was they felt the need to do that. Uh, I would explain to them how I perceived that. Um, and I would talk to them about what the concerns were and could we address them. Because actually, in the end, we did address their concerns. You, you know, so, so it's a huge amount. And, you know, that sounds great. So every time I meet people now, I behave absolutely perfectly. Yeah, right. <laughs> Jane will tell you different. <laughs> um, so you know, these are the sort of outcomes you want from people. <coughs> but I mean, I hate the idea that you know, it, it almost becomes like um, a religion. We're all going to walk around and we're all going to be have halos around our head and we're all going to be shining examples and we're all going to be great. What a boring place to work that would be. You know? <laughs> People aren't perfect, they're not going to be. I don't think you should try and make them perfect. They should behave reasonably. Um, but, but, you know, just expect everybody will come in, you know, not feeling so good one day. You will. And that's bound to affect your relationships a bit. But be aware of it. I think that, that's the thing. Be aware. Awareness is really important. Um, so, I've explained those. I presume you get, they're all getting copy of the slides, are they? Yeah, they're yeah, 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 that's okay. So I don't need to go through it, but you, you, get, you get the sort of things that are really important towards it. Um, you know, sometimes as a leader, uh, it, to me, it's always, my first choice is always trying to engage people. And, and I've sort of, I'm a very impatient sort of person. I want everything done yesterday. And sometimes that gets on the road of being a decent leader. Because 
you tend to go into autocratic mode instead of democratic mode, I just tell them to do it. And actually on occasions, people will do it. You know, they will. But it's not the best way to do really big things. The best thing is to engage and involve people, discuss it, because actually you'll have less hassle when you do that in the end. If you impose things on people, there'll be some people who will say, well, I'm not going to make that work. I'm going to do what I can to stop it. You know? Whereas if you've engaged and had the discussion, you, I'm not saying you won't get that behavior. You're less likely to get it. Um, but sometimes you need to be pretty autocratic. You know, if you, Pip and I have done some work with, with in, in Kenya, and one of the guys we used to work with who tragically got murdered about 18 months ago, um, he was a, an ex-colonel in the, the paratroop regiment, a really, really decent man. You'd never meet a better bloke. Um, but on a battlefield, <laughs> you can't afford to say, oh, let's just sit down, guys, and have a chat about whether we do this. You know, what do you think, Private? And what do you think? You know, sometimes you've just got to say, we're doing it. But what you learn when you work with these people in the army is that they have built that trust between them that they can depend on each other, you know? And, and he would even, even then, he wouldn't make the decision on his own, but he would know that you probably couldn't have time to discuss with everybody, but you would check it out on one or two people, you know? So it's, it's, it is interesting. And I mean, um, emotional intelligence, vision developed, I think, you know, I, I love it. Um, one of my former students now is the Pro Vice Chancellor at Bournemouth University uh, for internationalization. Um, she got into her role two years before me. <laughs> She's 36 now. And I think that's fantastic. And I, I say, did I help? She says, yeah, you really did. And I go, I'm not sure I did, but I still feel really good about it. You know, developing other people is just great. When they achieve stuff because you've you know, and one of the great things about my job uh, in, in education is that you get that chance to actually help people to really, really shine. And I, I just take huge satisfaction. And sometimes you've got to curb your jealousies. <laughs> I remember when she rang me up and said, oh, I've just got the, the PVC's job at, at Bournemouth. And do you know what? There was a little bit of me went, <laughs> taught you everything you know. <laughs> but I got over it quick. Got over quick. I said, no, of course not. <laughs> and I really meant it. Of course I'm delighted. But, but there was a bit of, oh, I've worked all these years now. I haven't made that. And there she is at 36 and there already. Um, but great. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, right. The thing about vision is you need to know where you're going. But it doesn't have to be your vision. It shouldn't be your vision. If it's your vision, you need to really check it out that other people believe in it as well. Um, so I don't think as a leader you have to have the vision. Uh, if you're a smart leader, you learn from other people and borrow from them and so on. And above all, you take on board their views and, and m modify your vision. Um, you've got to get people to think creatively. One of my worries about you know the big TQM movement that that was and. If you look at everything now, it's all about systems and processes. If, you, if you're over-systematized, and I'm not saying you don't need systems and processes, of course you do, but if you overdo that, people don't have to think about their job anymore. So they won't be thinking about, how can we do this better? They just do it. And have you ever encountered that? Certainly in my organization, because we're very bureaucratic, I encounter that. When you say to people, so why do we do that? They haven't got a clue. But because it says in the book, that we do it that way. And that might not be sensible. Um, so building the shared vision is really important, engaging people in it. Um, I think ambition is really important, not for yourself. Um, for organization and other people. It, you may not believe this, I, I never wanted to be a dean of a business school. I really, it didn't enter my mind until I got a phone call one day asking me if I was interested in, actually, I, I, in, in a week, I got in, asked if I was interested in two or three jobs. And I went, well, me? Uh, uh, and then you think, well, could I do it? Do I think I would enjoy it? Would I get something out of it? So, you, you know, but ambition for the organization is really important. I am hugely ambitious for the business school and the university. Absolutely, completely. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not content to sit back and, and you know, that 
the, the fact, the fact that, because Jane can tell you the truth about me when I go. <laughs> it's great. It's, it's actually comfortable, it's except when I walk out the door, I know Jane will say, <laughs> <laughs> he is so full of. <laughs> um, honesty is important. Now, honesty is a difficult one. You should never tell lies. Um, but sometimes the timing of telling the truth and how you tell the truth are really important. Right, you know? I, I've had a, had a couple of occasions when I've got bad numbers in about the business school. Do I share those numbers with people when I get it? Am I straight away out? Hey guys, we've got a problem. No, I think about it first. And I try to... We, we had a, about three years ago, we had a budget cut in mid-year of about half a million quid. Um, and I could have gone out and... Jane doesn't know this, I don't. <laughs> uh, I, I went out. I could have gone out to the business school and said, we've got a real problem here, we're going to have to make cuts, we're going to have to do this. And I didn't. I sat down with a couple of people and talked it through. And we actually worked out a way that we could handle it. It meant we couldn't spend on developing new things, but we could, chan you know. So I sorted it and I thought, really my job is to protect you guys from this that's going on. In some cases though, I would have gone and shared the problem and said, have you got any solutions? But I felt my responsibility as, as a leader there was to stop people from panicking and worrying. And if there was a solution that could be found, then that would be great. Why worry them with that? Do, do, do you see what I mean? And it's quite a difficult, you know, sometimes these things, I'm, I'm giving you black and white situations and then they're not. There's lots of shades of grey in there. Um, but, but honesty is really important. I think the other bit is um, responsibility. My, my one key word in leadership is responsibility. Responsibility for, Pip's probably heard me say this about a million times, and Jane's heard me say it certainly a couple of times. It's about taking responsibility for yourself, uh, for the people around you, for the organisation that you're part of, and if you want to extend it further, the society that you're part of, and all of those things. And hey, I'm not a religious person, I'm not being evangelical there. I'm like everybody else. I don't do all of that very well in some times. But I am aware of it. And respecting other people being important. You know, just... So, I'm about to finish, you'll be pleased to hear. I'm not going to say about these things. I've said them really. I think the other bit is about remembering how you help to develop people. So how do you develop yourself and others? I think diagnostics, the stuff you're doing with PIP, are really important. Some people have a lot of cynicism about um, psychometrics. All I can tell you, whenever I look at them and look at my own, I go, that's pretty much me. You know, I can get down, I can debate one or two things. I have some, seen some people who are very cynical about it. Trust me. If you don't recognise it, one of two things happened. You've lied when you filled in the questionnaire, and I have seen people do that to try and create a profile that they want. Um, or, actually, you're not very self-aware, and you haven't got yourself yet, and all that's doing is holding a mirror up to you. It's not 100% correct, but do you know what? Talk to other people, and you'll go... I showed mine to my wife, and she said, Uh-huh, <laughs> <laughs> that's you. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, it's interesting because everything on there, I'm the opposite of. <laughs> <laughs> Which is probably why our marriage has lasted all this time. Um, I think the bit about learning from experience is important. Learning from practice. You know, the big thing is think about what worked, what didn't work, why did it work, why did it not work. And it's actually often easier to learn from things that go wrong. Because sometimes when things happen, you, don't, you can't reflect on it, it just happens, right? But when they go wrong, quite often there's an element of you as to why they've gone wrong and learn from it. And coaching, I always thought I would never, you know, mentoring other people is good and coaching other people, but being coached yourself, um, well, I, I never thought it would be of benefit to me, but I have to say, one of the best things I've, I've done over the last few years is have a coach. Um, it's more like therapy for me, actually. <laughs> I just pour my soul out. Um, and she's great. At, uh, she, she supported me through a lot. Um, just finished with some quotations. 
I love the first one. The wicked leader is he who the people, it's, it's ancient Chinese, he or she, right? Let's not get hung up on it. Is he who the people despise? The good leader is he who the people revere. The great leader is he who the people say, we did it ourselves. <laughs> right? That's really important. Um, and then a couple of others. So, um, do you have any questions? And thank you for listening. Um, I hope I haven't bored you rigid. <laughs> and uh, I hope there's at least something to take away from what I've said. It's just, it's just a sort of personal experience thing, really. Uh, and to ha try, I mean, the big thing is, I think, is a, a two things as a, as a teacher. There's a great quotation. My favorite quotation is Oscar Wilde. Uh, and Oscar Wilde says, um, whatever is worth knowing cannot be taught. I can't actually teach you anything. Uh, the only thing I can do is, I hope, make you want to learn more about it. You know, and if I've done that, then in my book I succeeded. So, you know, thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.